All right, welcome everyone to our math workshop. Um, if you got the email, we're gonna be doing the first half uh, is, is gonna be stuff that we've uh, just figured out and, and pointed at, hey, these are a couple common problems that people run into that you can solve pretty easily with math. Uh, and the second half is gonna be if you guys have any ideas for things that you wanna go over related to math, then we can do that. Uh, like if anyone wants a quick uh, brief on uh, vector algebra or uh, some linear algebra or anything like that, we can do some stuff like that at the end uh, and give you a, a primer on that. Um, but if you're gonna be following along with our workshop today, um, I know a couple people have problems getting lost because I type really fast, so uh, the code is already done and it's up there. Uh, if you go to that repo and clone it, uh, that will have all of the materials for today's workshop uh, already done for you. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, this is the repo, uh, it's just called Unity Examples. Uh, right now it has uh, a couple of them, most of them are math, there are a few other ones that a couple people have asked me for, but if you have any suggestions for examples to put up, uh, just send them my way and I'll let you know if we decide to put them in. Cool. <clears throat> so, the first thing that we're gonna do is talk about uh, movement. So, uh, a, a pretty simple, you know, game that everyone's gonna start off making. It's gonna be something along the lines of a top-down uh, RPG sort of thing. Uh, you walk around and do stuff or fight enemies, uh, anything like that. Uh, so. Let's go ahead and, th this is just a simple scene set up where we have a player, let's turn off the camera because we can't see it anymore. So we've got a player here in the center and they're just gonna walk around as usual. So if we go ahead and play the fast diagonal scene, you'll see we just move around and stuff like that. Uh, but you might also notice that, hey, it looks like I move really, really fast when I'm moving on the diagonals and I move slower when I'm moving to the sides. And uh, if you've done some work with uh, movement before, you probably already know what the problem is. Uh, but luckily we only have one script to check out, so let's go ahead and open our C-sharp project. Uh, and we'll take a look at whatever script that we're gonna be working with. Uh, if you're not in this scene yet, it's Fast Diagonals, and we're gonna take a look at Fast Diagonals Movement Controller, uh, which is on our player. Give that a few minutes to open. Come back tomorrow when Visual Studio is opened. <clears throat> I guess while that's going, I'll pull it back up again. That's the URL right there, in case you wanted to follow along. Just clone that repo, and then open it up in Unity, and go to the perspective, uh, sorry, not perspective depth, the fast diagonals example. All right, so close that. And that one, let's check out our fast diagonals movement controller. So this is a pretty simple script. It's only about 25, 27 lines, uh, depending on whether or not you count the using statements. Uh, and as usual, we're just a public class. We inherit from mono behavior. Uh, and we've got this, I'll point out the important bits first, and then we'll go through and we'll actually check out what our problem is and how to fix it. Uh, the most important bit is right here. We have a float, that's our movement speed, uh, and then we have a private rigid body, which we grab when we're awake, and then on update, uh, we'll go through and we say our velocity is this vector two of our horizontal input, our vertical input times our movement speed. Uh, so this line right here is what's getting called right now, and we have this sort of awkward, not natural, uh, extra speed up on the diagonals. Um, so a really good way to approach problems like this is if you think you have a problem, first thing first, prove it. So we've got this log velocity magnitude in here, and uh, down here, we're just gonna say, if we want to log the velocity magnitude, just debug.log the velocity magnitude. Uh, that way we can check, hey, when I'm moving to the right, what's my velocity? When I'm moving on a diagonal, uh, what's my velocity then? 
So pretty simple script. Let's grab our player and scroll down in their inspector to the log velocity magnitude, and we'll check it. And our movement speed is two, so when we're moving to the right, we should have a velocity magnitude of two. Uh, when we're moving on diagonals, we want it to be two, but I don't think it's two. So let's go ahead and play it. You can see right now our velocity is zero. When we're moving to the right, our velocity is two. And when we move on a diagonal, we get this 2.828427 way off into infinity. Um, so that's kind of odd. I mean, we, we thought our uh, diagonal movement was you know, not what we expected it to be. But this number is pretty strange. So uh, I guess a, a good way to look at it is, what's the, what's the difference between this velocity and what we want? Well, it's really this 0.82 bit off the end. But if you already know this, then uh, you can probably tell that this 2.82 divided by our original one is about 1.41, which, if you're also familiar, is about the square root of 2. So really, our diagonal velocity is about the square root of 2 times what it should be. Uh, and the reason for that, which you might now finally realize, is, hey, well, that's like you know, Pythagoras' theorem. We've got uh, one on one side, one on the other side, and the diagonal is now the square root of two. Uh, so really, what we want is when we go to a diagonal, we don't want to have our input velocity be, you know, right one and up one, because that would give us that extra square root of two of speed on the diagonal. We really want it to be that divided by the square root of two. Uh, but how do we do that? Um, Real simple, all we have to do is use this line right here, which is the same as our previous one, but we just normalize our input right after uh, we get it and right before we multiply it by our movement speed. For those of you unfamiliar, vector normalization just says, uh, I take this vector, which has an x and y component, and then I find its length, and then I divide both components by its length, and that will give me a vector which has a length of one. So now, when we're moving to the right, our input will be normalized to one. When we're moving on the diagonal, it'll start at that extra uh, square root of two, but then we'll bring it back to one by normalizing it. So we've got a handy little Boolean in here. We can just say normalize movement, and it'll use this different line instead. So if we just check normalize movement, clear a console, and play again, Now you can sort of see it always stays at that nice constant 2, even when we're moving on our diagonals. So that's a really easy one, uh, pretty simple. One of the first things that people bump into when they're starting out with math and game programming. So uh, let's go to one that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, if you've ever made a game in Unity, like a platformer, uh, you might have run into wall sticking, uh, which I guess is best illustrated by just doing it. So uh, in order to show the wall sticking, go to your uh, wall stick scene, click on the player, find the wall stick movement controller, and click uh, set velocity to check it. Uh, the other ones we can leave alone for now. These are just a couple basic platforming constants. Uh, how far we are away from the ground when, we can, when we're grounded and we can jump our movement speed, our jump speed, and how long we have to wait between jumps. So if we go ahead and play the scene, we can move around, but when we jump, we stick to walls, as long as we're holding the right key. And then if we let it go, we start falling as normally again. Which is weird, because like it totally works over here when I want it to fall normally, so why do I just stick to walls here? All right, so let's go ahead and check that controller out. So that one's going to be under wall stick, wall stick movement controller. So here we've got whether or not to set the velocity or use forces. So that's a spoiler for the end. Uh, we've got our couple constants here for making sure that our platforming works correctly. Uh, we get our rigid body, and we keep track of how long it's been since we last jumped. Uh, when we're awake, we just initialize those. Uh, and on our update, 
Uh, we have set velocity checked, so we'll look at this code first. Um, and if we use this, our character will stick to walls. All we do is take our rigid body's velocity and we set it to our horizontal uh, movement speed, uh, horizontal input times our movement speed, uh, and our current y velocity. So what we're doing is when we press right, we just take what our current velocity is, replace the x component, uh, and then set that to our velocity again. Um, if we don't use this uh, little bit at the end with this rigidbody2d.velocity.y, if we don't keep our y component, when we move to the right, we won't be able to jump anymore. It'll zero out our y uh, velocity as soon as uh, we start moving left and right. Uh, this stuff down here is just making sure jumping works correctly, and checking if grounded is just a raycast. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, feel free to explore the code later, but uh, that's just platforming stuff. So uh, yeah, big problem. Um, and a lot of people like to set their velocity by just you know, directly setting it. And they say, hey, I want to move back and forth. I'll just set my velocity for my rigid body. Um, but this is the most obvious problem that results from it. You get wall sticking. Um, so why does this happen? Uh, the really big reason why is because uh, when you're doing physics in video games, uh, when you set the velocity of something, uh, there's no going back. The physics system isn't allowed to reach in and say, well, actually, you're next to a wall. You shouldn't really, like, you can apply as much uh, velocity as you want, but uh, you, you can't really move past this wall. But when you set the velocity directly, you sort of strong arm it and say, no, I am moving to the right. I definitely am all the time. Uh, so the trick for fixing this is really simple. Uh, we just use add force instead. If you've already used Unity's rigid bodies, you're probably familiar with add force. Uh, here all we're doing is saying add force, uh, our horizontal times right times our movement speed. So instead of directly setting our velocity, now we're gonna use forces. And all we have to do to use that is just uncheck that set velocity box. So go ahead and uncheck that. And now when we play, our player will move a little bit differently. They'll get more speed up and slow down. But when we jump, we no longer stick to walls. So that's great. That's exactly what we wanted. We can no longer do the thing where we just cheese and like wall jump all over the place. So really simple, uh, really easy to fix. Uh, but this naturally leads us to another problem of, well, hey, setting the velocity worked really great because I sped up really fast and I stopped really fast. And that's sort of like the really tight movement that I wanted. Uh, I didn't want this sort of like loose, sort of fluid, uh, you know, speed up real slowly and get really, really, really fast if you go for long enough and then slow down really slowly uh, kind of movement. So how do we fix that? And if you haven't gotten the theme yet, the answer is more math. Um, so. We now know the reasons why we want to use uh, forces for everything, uh, because it helps us prevent you know, messing with the physics system and wall sticking and a whole bunch of other problems, which I'm sure you're, uh, you'll run into uh, if you do that. Uh, but let's go and try to find out how can we sort of take this uh, force first perspective for moving our player around and moving our objects around. and grab that and, and sort of manhandle it and get it under our control. So let's go to the smooth movement scene. So here, we're gonna go back to our overhead view. This is a person from overhead, just drawn with really badly programmer art at like two in the morning. So uh, here we've got a bunch of different, you know, settings in our smooth movement controller. So let's just, look at what we can get out of smooth movement uh, right off the bat. So we'll pull our game view over to the side. Uh, we've got a, a target component, a, uh, sorry, a target field in here that just links to this uh, target object, which you can sort of see is right here. And so let's have it chase this target around, you know? And, you know, you might be kind of surprised. That looks like really nice, smooth, natural movement. And now we can just have them chase this target wherever we move it. Uh, we don't even have to move the target smoothly, uh, but our person will chase it uh, exactly how we want it. Uh, additionally, 
we can also say, don't chase the target, listen to my keyboard input, just uncheck chase target, and now when you move, you get some nice smooth camera controls. Sorry, not camera controls, movement controls. Uh, so this is great, but how does this work at all? Uh, and how do I tweak these constants? Like, if I want it to be a little tighter than this, because uh, this has still got a lot of wobble in it, uh, a good way to do it is just to increase your acceleration a lot, like even, let's max this out. Let's actually go to like 35. Now it almost looks like our player is moving with our default set velocity controls, because it's really snappy. We snap to our full speed and we snap to a full stop. There's really no, none of that ramp up and ramp down anymore. So, you know, this works really great, but what are all these different things that we can do and how do they work? So, I don't know if we have a, do, Ryan, do we have a way to draw? Like math. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, let's let's just like we're gonna do paint, apparently. Uh, <laughs> all right, this is what we're gonna do math on today. I I hope everyone was suitably prepared for this. So let's open up our smooth movement controller, and we'll take a quick overview of it before we dive in and look at the nitty gritty of what math we're using. So we've got a bunch of our properties here. Uh, we get a rigid body, because we're gonna use it, spoiler. Uh, we've got an accelerate clamped function, an accelerate clamped toward, as well as a clamp velocity function. And then on our update, if we're chasing our target, we just call accelerate clamped toward this position that we want. Uh, and if we're not chasing a target, we just want to accelerate clamped with our input normalized, like we learned before. Uh, times our max velocity. So when we're chasing our target, we say, hey, move to here. When we are listening to keyboard input, we say, hey, try to get this velocity as quickly as possible, as well as possible. And then we also want to clamp our velocity in our fixed update. So let's take a look at clamp velocity first, because that's probably the easiest one. So if you're familiar with how rigid bodies work, you probably know we've got uh, a position, a velocity, and, a mag and a, uh, an acceleration that we can you know, get from our rigid body at any point in time. So I guess we'll try to draw this in paint. Please bear with me. So uh, if this is our object right here, we'll make it red. Oh no. This is so bad. I should just break up my tablet. All right. So we've got our object right here. This is whatever we've got our movement component on. Uh, so it's got a position, so it's got some X and Y. And if you're doing this in 3D, you probably also have a Z. Uh, and then in addition to this, you've got your velocity which points off in a direction, and you've, uh, so between these two, you've got two vectors. Um, I guess a good way to sort of think about the vector that is your position, because it might not be, you know, really, really clear that this velocity and this position are actually the same mathematical object. But if we draw our coordinate axes for the whole universe, optionally with a Z, you can sort of see that there's actually a vector all the way from the start that points to the current position of our object. So when I say the position, I'm really talking about this vector right here. The velocity is just a vector, uh, and even though it looks like, hey, it's coming off of my, uh, my current position, right? Uh, really, because that velocity uh, has its tail there, it can really be drawn at the origin. And these are the same vector, fundamentally. Uh, this vector isn't different because it's moved over here. Uh, it's still got the same length and points in the same direction. 
So, okay, we've got this position in space, we've got this velocity. Uh, normally we would just set our velocity, but like we sh showed before, that makes us stick to walls and it doesn't give us that sort of smooth interpolation between, hey, I'm moving left, I'm moving right, or I'm moving right, now I'm moving up. It doesn't really smoothly go from one to another. So a good way to conceptualize what you really want to do when you move in a direction is that you have some other component. Let's use green. You have some target velocity that you want. We'll call that, oops, not C. We'll call that our target velocity. We'll call this our current velocity. So these are both vectors that point out, uh, you can conceptualize them as coming from the end of your position. Uh, but these are both things that we know. We know what direction we want to go in right now, and we know what direction we're going in right now. Uh, so if you're familiar with how acceleration and uh, velocity and position all intermingle, uh, you know that uh, over time, acceleration determines your velocity, and over time, velocity determines your position. If you add uh, some acceleration, that'll eventually make your velocity change, and if you set your velocity to some value, that'll make your position change over time. So you can really think about it as there's a difference between these two vectors. So let's draw the difference between these two vectors, and that's just another vector right here, and this is our dv. This is the vector that goes to our target velocity from our current velocity. Uh, so really what we want to do is we want to smoothly move our current velocity to our target velocity. So this dv is going to be very key in doing that. Uh, so I guess the biggest thing to realize is that this dv, because it's a change in velocity, this is really an acceleration that we want to apply to our object. Uh, so when we say, hey, I want to move my current velocity onto my target velocity, what we really mean is I want this dv to somehow determine my acceleration. I think that's the wrong one. I think that's angular. Use that one. Um, so suddenly we've found what sort of acceleration we want to apply, and that's great because now that we know our acceleration, we can sort of figure out what kind of force we want to add to our rigid body. Uh, because if you remember from uh, high school physics or even maybe even earlier, you might recall like the most famous formula in physics, F equals MA. So we know that force equals mass times acceleration. Well, we know our acceleration and we want to find our force. So you just rearrange it a bit you get A equals M over F. Oops, sorry. Actually, we already have it in the form that we want because we know our mass and our acceleration. Uh, so we know our acceleration, we know our mass. That's easy, we can find our force now. Great. So uh, what are some properties that we want this uh, acceleration to have, this dV? Um, if we always make it uh, apply that same dv to our uh, current velocity to approach our target velocity, then we're just gonna end up with the exact same interpolation between them every time. And it might not even be what we want. What if we want it to like be a big, you know, slowly turning, lumbering, you know, like machine that's really heavy and takes a long time to change its current velocity? Okay, so uh, naturally, uh, we can think of it as things in the natural world have some maximum acceleration that they can undergo. Uh, humans, you know, won't go, uh, you know, have some huge force exerted on them. They won't exert some huge force on themselves. Uh, so what we want to do is take this uh, acceleration that we want to apply and we want to cap it. We want to say, don't accelerate more than some certain amount. So we'll go ahead and say, this is dv, but we only want this dv normalized times some 
maximum acceleration. And that's the force that we're going to apply instead of dv directly. That way we can tweak our maximum acceleration. If we have a high maximum acceleration, it'll make something that can change its velocity really quickly and it can turn really fast. If we have a, have a very low maximum acceleration, it'll be that sort of lumbering slow to react, uh, very big and heavy motion. Um, and then last thing, because we want a little bit more control, uh, what if we want to move faster than dv too? Like, uh, really, uh, that magnitude uh, capped at our maximum velocity is only, you know, what if we never get up to our maximum velocity? Because uh, our, sorry, our maximum acceleration. Because our velocity only happens to be a maximum of two, uh, for example, and the distance, you know, that we can have between our current velocity and our target velocity can only be at most four. Uh, if they're pointing in completely opposite directions. But what if I want to, you know, use a much stronger acceleration on it? I want it to move even snappier from pointing in one direction to pointing in the other direction. And it's really easy. We just say, hey, we'll have some modifier. We'll just say, I want dv to get multiplied by some acceleration. Uh, so this is just a constant. We just take our uh, dv that we want, multiply it by that, uh, and then cap it at our maximum acceleration. So if we go into our code, we can sort of see that this is exactly what we do. Uh, we have our target velocity, we find dv by saying that's our target velocity minus our rigid body's velocity, and then we say uh, we're going to set dv to it normalized times the minimum of its magnitude times uh, its acceleration. So that's where we get to throw in our own acceleration factor uh, and say, I want this to move really, really fast. Uh, and then uh, max acceleration. So it'll never be greater than max acceleration. So then we just add a force of dv times our mass with force mode force. Um, if you've worked with 3D rigid bodies or you plan on working with 3D rigid bodies, um, there's actually a much easier uh, one for 3D rigid bodies, which is just rigid body dot, oops, I think I need to, we're going to pretend that we have a 3D rigid body, so it'll give me auto completion. Dot add force, uh, here we get another force mode, uh, just like we say force mode 2D dot force here, we get to choose a force mode. Here we can just say dv and choose force mode dot acceleration directly. Uh, so if we say I want to pretend that this force that I'm adding is a pure acceleration, we don't have to multiply it by mass anymore. Unfortunately, that's only for 3D rigid bodies. 2D, we have to do the math ourselves. Max. Good question. Um, and it might be sort of tempting to think that velocity change is exactly the same as acceleration. Um, but really what it means is we're going to directly modify our velocity. And that gives us the same problem as when we set our velocity directly. So setting our velocity is the same as calling add force with uh, change velocity or velocity change or whatever it was. Um, so if you want smooth, proper movement, you should stick to forces and acceleration. Um, so we've got this really cool accelerate clamped. So let's, you know, let's try it out. Uh, to use it, we just have to turn chase target off. Uh, let's play with some of these values so we can get a feel for exactly what all of these do. Um, so we have our acceleration and our max acceleration. Uh, we also have a max velocity, which we cap our velocity at. We can never move faster than this maximum velocity. So let's try just, you know, let's start with default programmer values, set everything to one, and see what kind of movement we get. It's really slow, really unresponsive. Um, if I start moving in a direction, I will speed up a little bit until I hit, uh, I'm moving at one unit per second, and when I switch what direction I wanna go in, it takes a long time for it to catch up. And it also takes a long time to slow down. So let's move our max velocity up to like five, so that at least we can pick up some speed. So now we can go around and we can move much faster, but when we start moving in a different direction, it takes us a long time to sort of like swivel and say, okay, gotta 
pull my velocity vector off in the direction I want it to. So if we change our acceleration and we make our acceleration very high, like five, not that much changes right now. And the reason for that is that our max acceleration is still capped at one. So let's bring that one up to five. And now we should see a little bit more responsive movement. We speed up to our maximum speed a little bit faster. We change directions a little bit faster. It feels a little bit more uh, tight and natural. And the basic trend that you see is that as you increase your acceleration and max acceleration, the tighter your movement will get. So if we pump these up to like 20, then we get really snappy, good feeling movement. Which is great, because that's exactly the sort of thing that we want. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, there's another thing that we might want to do. And that is, what if we want to have some object in our world uh, go to some point? And I say, go over here. Uh, move to this point, do it naturally. I don't care how you get there. Uh, but make it look good. And that's what we do for the chase, chase target thing. So if we go in here and then back to our scene view and grab our target and move that around, our player will just pursue our target. But you might notice there's a little bit of like bob at the end and they do a little bit of slowing down before they get there. And that's controlled by this time to reach over here. So let's talk about what's different between just moving, trying to match a velocity and moving, trying to pursue some target. Let's erase a lot of this. Uh, let's see. I just like, there we go. Okay, so we've got the same tool as we had before. Uh, luckily, we already have a big portion of what we need to do written already. Uh, we have this accelerate clamped function. So as long as we can figure out what we want our velocity to be, we can really easily make it pursue some target properly. So well, let's see. So now we've got the same stuff that we did before. Pencil. We've got our velocity. But instead, we now have a target that we want to pursue. Uh, straight lines. So now we've got this vector, this vector. Oh, that's so straight. For our target, and this one for our position. Um, our target will just ignore its velocity for now. If you take game AI or you do stuff like that, you might be more interested in matching your velocity to your target's velocity as well. Uh, but we won't cover that. We'll just try moving to a point. So now we can sort of see, well, pretty obviously, there's this vector right here that we want our velocity to lie along. This is going to end up being our target velocity. So this is just our position, which we can call p. And we'll call their position q. So this is just the vector q minus p. And we'll call this vt for our target velocity. All right, so now that we know what direction we want to go in, uh, first, first things first, we've got to normalize that. We've got to say, hey, well, you know, if we're really far away, we don't want to try to get to some velocity that's incredibly huge. Uh, so let's definitely cap it at our max velocity. So we're going to say that our target velocity is this vector normalized times our max velocity. All right, so now we've truncated our vector. Now it looks more like this. And uh, we've gotten it more into a range that we're comfortable with. So what sort of behavior happens when we get close to our target? We've been assuming that we're really far away, 
But what happens if we're somewhere like right here? And our max velocity would overshoot us to about here. Uh, but really, we want to just have this sort of velocity. Well, OK, we don't really need to multiply by Vmax. Instead, we really just want to clamp it so it's smaller than Vmax. So we'll just say min of Vmax and the length of Q minus P. Uh, what this means is uh, we just want to take the length of this vector, and uh, if it's shorter than our max velocity, then we want to use that length. If it's longer than our max velocity, we want to use our max velocity. Uh, so we still do the truncation that we wanted to do, uh, but instead of bringing a shorter vector up to our max velocity, we just leave it short. Cool. So that's mostly what we do here. Uh, but the very last thing is we have this time to reach variable. Uh, and if you don't use some sort of time to reach variable, you'll find that your movement is still pretty good. Um, when, you get, when your uh, pursuer gets close to your target, whatever you're moving uh, gets close to your target, uh, it'll slow down and slowly reach it. Uh, so let's go ahead and we'll, we'll make this time to reach one so that uh, if we multiply it or divide it, nothing will happen. Uh, and we'll see what happens, how, how it approaches our target now. So when we move our target somewhere, oop, let's play here. When we move our target somewhere else, you can see that it approaches it and it perfectly reaches our target. No overshoot, it slows down and reaches it just in time. And that sort of makes sense. Uh, we constantly try to match our target velocity to uh, the vector between our current position and our target's position. And we get, when we get really close, we'll just constantly be matching our target velocity until it's zero, right at the target. So this gives us some really, really nice smooth movement, but it slows down really, really fast. Uh, and even when it gets close to the target, right about here, it starts slowing down, and by the time it even gets close to the target, it's, it's basically done. Uh, it's, it's not going to move very fast at all. So an easy way to fix that is the same way we did with acceleration. Uh, instead, we're going to use this idea of a time to reach, uh, where if we make it very small, uh, then we want our object to approach it and maybe overshoot it and bounce back a little bit. Uh, if we make it very large, then uh, we'll start slowing down even earlier. Uh, so we're just going to take our target velocity magnitude and divide it by this time to reach. So if we play with that, and we go to our time to reach, if we have it set as 1, we get our usual movement. But if we set it to something like 1 half, Now we get a, a little bit better, right? Uh, it slows down uh, when it's a little bit closer to it, uh, about half the distance away. Um, and it still reaches it pretty nicely. Um, but it still might be too slow for us. So let's try doing 0.25. You know, that should make it a quarter closer. So now when we move our target, yeah, see, getting even better. But what happens when I set it to something like 0.1? And this was sort of our default movement. You might notice that we overshoot it just a little bit. And that's because we don't give our player enough forewarning so that they can't slow down enough before they get there. We only tell our player, hey, start slowing down when you're right here. But our maximum acceleration that we can ever do won't stop us before we get to our target. So we overshoot it, and we come back a little bit. And we get a bounce to it. So yeah, the way to think about that is if we don't tell our object to slow down far enough away, because we can only apply a maximum amount of acceleration, we're going to overshoot it and then come back. But that's actually kind of nice. We want some things to sort of spring to somewhere and then wobble a little bit and get to their correct position. Uh, 
And if we turn this down even lower, we'll start seeing even more of that wobble. And if we turn it down really low, we get a lot of wobble. We might, we might not even stop. Uh, and so if you took physics in high school, you might say, hey, this kind of looks like a harmonic oscillator, kind of like a spring. And if you said that, you're completely right. Because if we make it so we always attempt to uh, approach our point at maximum acceleration, it does act as a harmonic oscillator. It's just a spring force. Yeah, it probably is gaining a little bit of energy, a little bit of energy. Um, so don't crank it down too far. Don't crank it up too far. Uh, we can always just set this back at point one, and it'll just arrive nicely like we want it to. So that's a pretty quick overview of some really nice, simple, uh, theoretical uh, movement properties that we can sort of play with the variables and then observe what they do. So before I go on to, uh, I guess, probably the last, last thing, do we have any questions about movement? Cool. So last one is kind of like a fun one. Uh, this is more of a neat trick than anything else. We'll pop out of 2D mode because we're going to talk about uh, this cool effect uh, where you can uh, deepen and shallow your perspective uh, with the camera. So. Right now we've got our camera here, uh, we've got our box in view, and we've actually got a game object called perspective camera, and then we've got our camera under that for complicated reasons. But uh, we've got our usual settings, uh, 60 degree field of view, uh, clipping planes at 0.3 and 1,000, uh, and all the rest is kind of, don't need to worry about it yet. But we've also got this perspective depth camera, which is pretty poorly named, but, uh, and this has our viewing plane width on it. So, before we get too deep into it, I'll show you kind of what it does. So we've got our cube rotating here. And if you've uh, used orthographic perspectives before, you might be saying, hey, what if I want something that's not exactly a perspective uh, projection, but I don't exactly want an orthographic perspective? So if we bring our field of view down really, really far, you can see, well, hey, our cube doesn't look like it has any foreshortening anymore. It's basically an orthographic pers uh, projection of it. And we can sort of verify that if we just change our camera to orthographic. It looks the same, maybe a little bit bigger because our camera values changed. But it looks the same as when we had uh, our perspective on. All of the squares look about the same size regardless of how far they are away from us. So let's put it back at perspective. And now we've got our cube that looks really orthographic. Conversely, if we up our field of view a lot. We might need to move our camera a little bit closer until we hit our clipping plane. Turn this down a little bit. Oh, I don't think I can. Move it out. Right there. Let's try that. And instead, we're going to just uh, decrease our viewing plane width. OK. So now we've got a rotating cube, but now it looks really wacky. It looks really, really like it's stretching all over the place. Um, so we probably wouldn't use this incredibly exaggerated perspective, but maybe something a little more modest, like this, where a cube stretches a little bit more and uh, pinches a little bit more as it gets close to and away from us. So if we move this up, you can see now we've got this sort of big stretchy cube that acts much differently than our uh, original cube. It's got a very exaggerated perspective. Um, so how do we do this? Because I've never seen this done before. Uh, why would I even want to do this? Because it looks bad. Or it looks good. It looks great. I want to put it in super hot. Um, so let's go check out our code for the perspective depth. Uh, we've also got this rotate over time, which is just the most basic script you can imagine. We just uh, pick a random rotation and then increase and just rotate our object by that over time. Um, as a really quick short one, an easy way to pick a random rotation is uh, just pick a random vector and rotate around it. Uh, and that's what we do 
uh, in here, we just have our rotation axis. When we wake up, we pick a random vector on our unit sphere of unit length. And then on update, we just rotate by a new quaternion, which has an angle of rotation speed times our delta time, uh, and a rotation axis that we picked earlier. So that'll just give us some random uh, vector to rotate around when we start up. As for our perspective depth camera, we've got this viewing plane rip width, and we've got our camera. When we wake up, we grab our camera, and then in our update, we do some math. Um, that involves our near plane and our viewing plane width and uh, tangent and field of view and oh no, please not this stuff anymore. So let's go through and go, uh, go uh, look at the theory behind it. So what we're doing between our two different projections, uh, our very orthographic projection versus our very perspective projection, is we're just changing how uh, our camera interacts with its uh, viewing plane, its near plane. Uh, an orthographic camera looks a lot like this. You know, you've got, this is from the side, by the way. You've got your viewing plane and your lines for your uh, frustum bounds for your camera go off infinitely in straight lines in all directions. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, where your camera lies on the z-axis because it's still going to have this perfectly rectangular prism frustum. Um, and that's why it gives us an orthographic pr projection, because any points that end up uh, inside of our frustum in here just get projected directly onto our viewing plane. Um, they don't scale down if they're far out. Uh, points that are above the frustum and below the frustum just don't get rendered at all. Uh, they don't get projected onto our plane. We don't see them. Uh, whereas with a perspective projection, our viewing plane still looks the same. It's still this, you know, rectangle in space. But now our camera has a position behind it. And our viewing frustum looks more like this. Uh, sorry for the bad angle. Um, you can sort of see that this has got, you know, some uh, big, it's sort of like a big pyramid that's truncated on top. Uh, if we carry this out some more, uh, eventually we'd be able to see our far plane, which is somewhere way out here. Let's draw our far plane. Our far plane would look something like that to here, over to here, and up to here. So now we've got a near plane and our far plane. Uh, our orthographic camera also has a far plane, but our far plane is exactly the same size as our near plane. That's really bad. I'm, in, I'm actually in an art class right now, I swear. Um, so a good way to think about uh, how shallow or deep our perspective is, is what is the ratio between our far plane's size and our near plane's size? When we have an orthographic camera, uh, no matter how far away something is from the camera, it's the same size when it gets projected onto our near plane. Uh, something that's a meter tall over here, and something that's a meter tall very far away, both look a meter tall when they're projected onto our screen, when they're rendered. So if we put them side by side on our screen, they'd both look exactly the same size, even though one is really close and one's really far away. Uh, if we do the same thing with a perspective projection, we have a meter tall thing really close and a meter tall thing very far away. This time, when we render it, the thing that's very close looks about the same, but the thing very far away gets squashed, and it's much smaller. That is exactly why in 2D mode, no matter how far away something is along the z-axis, it won't get any smaller, because we're using an orthographic uh, 
projection instead of a perspective one. Um, so two really big differences here, but you know, it's not just uh, either everything's the same size or things are you know, some fixed amount, some fixed ratio smaller. Uh, we can control uh, what our frustum looks like for our camera. Um, you know, you can sort of imagine if we have a frustum that looks kind of like this, and it's got a near plane that's small and a far plane that's large, that's going to look a lot different from something like this. That's got a near plane and a far plane that are actually, you know, pretty close in size to each other. Um, so this one will result in a lot of foreshortening. Things very far away look very small. Uh, and this one will result in less. Things very far away will get a little smaller, but not too much. So this is kind of the effect that we're going for. And that's why when the cube rotates towards us, it feels like it sort of like reaches out really, really far. And then uh, when it comes away, goes away from us, it like retreats out into the distance really far. Uh, because we're foreshortening a lot, when we get far away, uh, and we're making it much larger when it gets close to the camera. So uh, in Unity, we can control the shape of our frustum kind of roughly uh, with this field of view. You can sort of see that a really uh, large field of view will give us a frustum that's uh, got a very small near plane and a very large far plane, whereas a very small field of view will give us a very small near plane and a far plane that actually is not in a totally bad ratio to it. Uh, normally, uh, we use six, a 60 degree field of view, um, but just as you know, a game designer, you're allowed to use whatever field of view you want because it's your game. And it doesn't matter if you know, it's not exactly the same as a realistic human eye because it's just a game. It's not real life. So the big question now becomes, how do we get some sort of transition between uh, some s shallow perspective like orthographic and some deep perspective like a very uh, wide, pointy uh, uh, perspective projection? Let's go ahead and wipe this away. And let's talk about geometry, because this is actually super easy to solve using a tiny little bit of trig. So uh, we'll say that our camera is here. Oop, same problem as before. I'm going to grab my pencil. Our camera's here. Uh, and we've got some field of view along here. We'll call this theta. Uh, so this theta is commonly referred to as our FOVI, which just stands for our field of view uh, along the Y uh, direction. So that's how open or closed uh, our frustum is. So we're just looking at it from the side. Uh, so then we've got our near plane, which happens somewhere out here. And then somewhere way out in the distance, we've got our far plane. Uh, we also know that our near plane is some distance away, our near plane distance. And we also know that our far plane is some far distance away. So uh, we can change the properties of our camera all we want, but the real thing that we're mainly concerned about is keeping our camera uh, roughly in proportion to how it is uh, when it's orthographic as when it's perspective. Uh, and the real key thing to sort of notice is that we really just want to preserve this height. We want to make it so no matter whether our view is really wide and open or very uh, closed and orthographic, uh, that this height stays the same. Because in the end, things will get projected onto it and we want something that's pressed right up against our viewing plane to be the same size when we're in an orthographic view as when we're in a perspective view. So we want to preserve this height. We want to choose our field of view to make it either very big and get very deep perspective or very shallow and get very orthographic perspective. So the only things that are left to change are our near plane distance and our far plane distance. 
and this sort of makes sense. Uh, if we change our fovea uh, or we change our height, then we really want to adjust our near plane to move it closer to us because we want to shrink uh, the size of the plane or move it farther from us to make it bigger. So let's do some trig. Uh, real simple, we've got our near plane distance here, our height here. We'll go ahead and cut this in half. And now we've got a right triangle. This is just going to be height over two. And this is just going to be theta over two. Uh, and we want to find our near distance. So we know our angle, we know our y. Uh, what do we want? We just want our cotangent. Uh, remember that cotangent of theta equals cosine theta over sine theta. Uh, we know what we want our y-axis to be because that's our height. Uh, so we want to find our width by just multiplying cotangent theta by our height over two. But this theta is really going to be theta over two because we were using half the angle here. So overall, our formula is just going to be that we want our near plane to be height over two times cotangent theta over two. Far plane, just leave it alone for now. Don't worry about it. Uh, it's not a big deal uh, unless you start getting some uh, issues with uh, when things get really far away, they might start Z fighting with each other if your uh, far plane is not properly, uh, like properly adjusted to be closer. But for the most part, it'll be fine. So uh, we don't usually have a cotangent function, so we'll just change this into a tangent function. Cotangent is one over tangent, so now we have height over two times tangent theta over two. And that's it. That's all we need to do. If we go to Visual Studio, we can sort of see our near plane is viewing plane width because Unity uses the horizontal field of view instead of the vertical, over two, over the tangent of our field of view, over two, and we change it to radians. And that's exactly the same formula we have here. Really easy, just a little bit of trig. Uh, and now we can adjust our perspective so it's shallow or deep. When we have a really shallow perspective, things sort of stay the same size, whether they're close to you or far away. When we have a very deep perspective, things get exaggerated. Turn this down, let's turn it down, not turn it down. A funny thing that you will have to play with is how close your camera is to your object as a forewarning. Let's actually just try making this bigger. And it's disappeared. Probably because it just ate my frustum. Anyway, uh, so cool. Now we can change our perspective. Awesome, that's it, that's the whole thing. Uh, any questions? <laughs> okay, so if you have any suggestions, just send them there or just like find me sometime and then like say, hey, I have, I have an idea. Don't ask me to do your homework though. <laughs> or trick me into doing your homework. <laughs> okay, that's all. Thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>